Chapter 113 Fifth Star The third layer of my advancement formation was almost complete. It seemed pitifully easy compared to how much I had struggled previously. The improvement to my ability to grow and study was truly amazing. Half a year ago when I first received the formation, it had been so complex that I barely felt capable of even starting it. Now, I looked at it like it was no more complex than a cube. Everything simply clicked into place. There were four more days in the week, the end of which would mark my first battles in the Summoner Division. I wasn't particularly concerned about how those would go. Like the puppet master said, I was the anomaly here. Every other summoner was painfully weak and would fall easily before me. But I still wanted to be efficient with my time. I was confident that by the end of the week, I would be in authority 5, but it would still take a bit of time to stabilize myself and find more weapons. I would be using the week of division battles to adapt to my body more and gather an arsenal. The weaponry I had briefly glimpsed previously would be crucial in the upcoming battles against knights and warlocks. I didn't think it would be particularly difficult to find those weapons. There was usually a batch waiting for me with every new dimension. I would need some practice with them though. Time to familiarize myself with their operation and usage. Imparted knowledge would only take me so far. I buckled down and focused on comprehending the rest of the advancement formation first. It was easy to pick up the little details with my improved psychic capabilities, but the sheer volume of information I had to process was what held me back this time. I was tracing out the formation in the air with my aura and psyche repeatedly, fine-tuning it until it was perfect. Once I finished a section, I would move on to the next, integrating completed chunks with the ever-growing sphere of my formation. Despite my incredibly thorough processes, it took me six hours to crunch through the formation. Well past midnight, inside of my room, I sat on a chair near the bed. Amara had curled herself up onto the sheets, reading her own book, her gaze occasionally drawn to me as I worked. I lounged back into the chair, having propped my feet up on a table, continuing to fine-tune a few more connections in the formation. After I reached a satisfactory point, I stood up and wiped out all the vague chunks of formation in front of me. Then, I formed the first layer. Then the second, which sat on top of the first and interconnected with it via 144 runic lines. Then the third came, sitting on top of the second and linked in 312 separate places. Like that, the entire advancement formation was assembled, flashing once I finished drawing the last thread of aura. The bed creaked under Amara as she sat back up. You completed it? M.M. This is it. It's unbelievably complex. I can't imagine what they'll look like later. I can't either. But I just have to work on it bit by bit. I at least know it's possible to get better and do it. So what now? Now. I looked at the formation, the visualization entirely unnecessary as it was present within my mind. All I need to do is cultivate this. I'll sleep on it, and depending on how that goes, tomorrow I should be able to reach the threshold. Then I'll be going to Maxwell for the advancement. All right. She nodded as I crawled onto the bed, inviting me over and settling with me under the sheets. My mind was a bit drowsy, but not completely drained. It went to show how much more power I was infused with during the operation. After that, I went to sleep with her, my night filled with vivid imaginations. The next day passed by in a blur. I didn't bother going to the Magisterium with Amara, simply training during the day before heading to Maxwell's study at nightfall. My dream last night was valuable, like they always were. And although I had finished the formation, that dream had further solidified my understanding. Not only that, but the fifth star within my mind was almost spilling over its threshold. There was already enough psyche within my body, so now, I just had to cultivate a bit, reach the threshold, and trigger the advancement. And it would be happening tonight. I arrived at Maxwell's study, and it seemed he was already prepared for me. He even had that tempering chair ready and everything. You're ready. Yeah. I'm pumped. Sit in the chair. He waved, explaining as I took a seat. Although you can only ever temper yourself when you develop another spark, your mind still opens itself when a new dimension is opened. Thus, every advancement can have what could be considered a mini-tempering. Since your body was recently infused with power that pushed you to your limits, I want to harness some of that and temper you a bit more. Of course, you need to trigger the advancement first. So start doing that. I'll wait. Cool. I nodded and got comfortable. Triggering the advancement was as simple as gathering enough power a far cry from the processing and visualization I had to perform over the last few days. Cultivating the advancement formation drew power into my mind and flooded it through the paths and channels of the advancement formation. Now that I knew all of the formation, and since I had already cultivated many of the steps early, 
I was primed for advancement. It didn't even take an hour for the circulation to reach a peak. The stars within my mind that represented chunks of knowledge were all spinning in a whirlpool of space. It was an ocean, and it spun around my spark, increasing the speed of my mind accordingly. It wasn't blazing fast, but I already knew what speed it was trying to reach. Advancing would bring it up to that significantly faster than my current level. So I continued to circulate the formation. There was so much power inside of me that it felt almost trivial. And thus, after only three hours, I reached the threshold. I felt the psycho within my mind reaching a tipping point. I had the option to stop here if I wanted to wait for a more opportune moment, but this was exactly the moment. I stood on the edge of the precipice, and I stepped forward. I felt the tempering device activate at the same time, Maxwell's probing aura feeling the exact moment my star overflowed with power. Right as the psyche gathered in front of the fifth star, I felt a power bear down on my body, forcing even more psyche into me. I muttered as the barrier started to break down. Yeah, don't stop. Hmm. Keep going. I'm almost there. Please be quiet. Maxwell scoffed, making me laugh as the barrier shattered. Just then, the whirlpool of my mind exploded in speed, a central current around my spark creating a ring that looked like a blazing river. I could feel my speed of thought increase by what seemed like magnitudes. Even better, the increased speed of thought made it that much easier to process the information I received from the newly opened dimension. I felt the power of the spirits inside, of a whole other level than the ones from before, of much greater variety in weapons, armor, and tools. I outright ignored the feelings created by the tempering and the advancement of my mind. After what I went through during the crown operation, this was nothing. I just concentrated on finding some new weapons. I projected a drone into the new dimension, finding some weapons that made me break out into a large smile. Cartridge technology didn't change much after WW1, so most if not all rifles from America utilized the .30-06 caliber. Even into modern times, it was still a reliable and often used bullet. However, all cartridges had to be delivered, and the technology to do that changed drastically as countries around the world prepared for war and utilized the knowledge of experience given to them by WW1. Thus, the world was finally introduced to the first iterations of automatic infantry rifles, more commonly called the assault rifle. The first successful fielded assault rifle was developed by Germany and was called the STG-44. It was one of the weapons I found within the dimension and was chambered in 7.92 by 33 millimeters, a bullet that fell between small and large caliber developed specifically for the assault rifle. The introduction of the intermediate cartridge rifle. Automatic rifles weren't new at this time, but nothing quite like the assault rifle had ever made its mark until Germany fielded their own. It was only later after the war when the rest of the Western and European countries saw how effective it was that they created their own and made them standard issue. Even the term assault rifle came directly from the STG-44. Sturmgewehr, translated into English, was the weapon category's namesake. The rifle that I found within the dimension was the most basic variant without anything more than iron sights, and thus didn't really come with memories. I could only sense a basic level of information carried by the spirit which detailed the gun itself and its operation. I'd have to delve deeper for the variants to get special memories, which was kind of unfortunate. I wanted to see if I could get memories from a German soldier. Those kinds of perspectives would be enlightening. Another thing I noted was that I was no longer seeing weapons that were strictly made and fielded by America. I had already seen a German flamethrower and the partially European Lewis gun, so it was apparent that I would have access to a much larger variety. This excited me to no end. There was nothing quite like German engineering during WW2, after all. Besides the assault rifle, I found some other weapons like submachine guns, namely the MP40, which was also German. But I also found a cult classic. The Tommy gun. Once I had my bearings, that was the first weapon I summoned. Within the chair, the Tommy gun appeared in my hands. Unfortunately, this variant was one of the early models and thus didn't have the classic drum magazine. Granted, those were extremely prone to jamming, but I figured that these spirits would theoretically operate perfectly, so I wouldn't have to worry about that. It would make the weapon even more effective, and most importantly, fun. Remember kids, the first rule of gun safety is to have fun. Maxwell watched me from the side. Is that one of your new spirits? Yeah, this thing is a hell of a gun. I'll finally be able to complete the gangster look. What? Never mind. HM, come over here. Let me give you the next formation. Maxwell waved as I stood from the seat 
the Tommy gun going back into the dimension as he pulled out an odd crystal object. The advancement formation to Authority 6 consists of three clusters, each cluster containing four formations that interconnect. Each cluster must also connect in a certain order and via specific connections from specific formations. The connections in total exceed 5,000. So you've got your work cut out for you. Fucking hell. What is that thing anyway? It's your advancement formation. He held up the crystal ball. After focusing on it with my supervision, I was able to see tons of tiny runic lines and symbols within. At a certain point, these things become too complex to simply write on paper. I could fill a booklet with the diagrams necessary to outline the formations, let alone the connections between them. So we summoners utilize these special white crystal orbs to contain the information, making it easier to handle. There are projecting devices you can put these orbs onto which will create an image out of the data. Or you can just stream your psyche into it and directly handle the information with your mind. It's your choice. Here. He placed a device below the orb, a cradle that supported the crystal ball and shone a light through it. Then, in the air appeared what was basically a hologram. It showed me the three clusters as well as each formation within those clusters. It also showed the connections between each cluster and formation. You could zoom in on specific parts, and it seemed there were diagrams and explanations for each formation and connection to assist in comprehension. Regardless though, there was so much complexity and information that my shoulders ended up dropping in defeat. I'm never gonna advance again. This path is much more difficult than the standard. Yes, but you're already more powerful than Authority 8 Summoners. Either way, you're already on this path and can't turn back, so I suggest you prepare yourself for much worse in the future. Depending on how long it may take you to complete the first formation within the first cluster, I'm estimating at least a year for you to complete this. Perhaps exactly a year, depending on how smart you really are. I mean, I'm not stupid, but this is insane. I mean, how small does this shit get? I squinted my vision zooming in on one of the formations, specifically a dense chunk of lines and runic symbols. This was the kind of stuff you'd see on a circuit diagram, and not for a simple one either. I've seen many before, and this was as complex as the schematic for a CPU. Sure, there were only 12 formations as compared to the previous three, but each one was also several times denser. It seriously seemed impossible for me to ever comprehend this. Maxwell spoke in what seemed like comfort. The future will be worse than this but your next advancement formation actually won't be that bad. Maybe a tiny bit worse than this one. They're generally equal in complexity. That's because this needs to lay the foundation for the next one. You'll start discovering exactly what these advancements are doing to your mind and why as you comprehend this formation. I'm going to be giving you all my notes on these as well, not just so you can perhaps correct any possible errors, but also so you can begin to understand the direction yourself. This will be crucial for your future. MM. Thanks, I guess. At least now, though, I get to be a wizard with a crystal ball. I took the orb and projection device, stashing it away. It was at least a lot more convenient than giant sheets of paper. With that, business was finished. Contact me if you find any issues with the formation. Also, you're getting to the point where marriage is becoming a viable option. I suggest you consult me before doing so. I mean, Amara and I are doing pretty good, but I think a bit more time would be nice. I meant regarding your summons, you brat. Go on now. I laughed as he waved me out. However, I had one more concern. Hang on. I have an inquiry. What is it? President Carrion is forcing me to participate in the tournament. I discussed it with the puppet master, and he says that I should give it an honest try. What do you think? That's a difficult situation. He frowned. John, those nobles are getting to the point where you're more of an eyesore than they're willing to put up with. They should begin to make attempts on your life, especially now that you're going to be leaving the magisterium soon. They want Amara, and they want you gone. So, an event like the tournament where accidents can happen would be a good place to kill you. Yeah, I figured. And you won't be able to kill them in defense. If a noble were to kill another student, even if they were another noble, nothing much would happen. There might be bad blood, perhaps some compensation in short jail time, but it would end there. You, on the other hand, would be prosecuted to the fullest extent possible by law and put away for only God knows how long. You could kiss your future goodbye, because you'd also probably be killed in jail. It would be a great achievement to become the first summoner to ever become the grand champion, but you lie in a precarious situation. You need to balance the risk and reward. The safest avenue would be to simply forfeit during the division battles. The most dangerous would be to shoot for the top. It's up to you, but know that one mistake can be the end of you, especially with how lethal you are. 
M.M. I nodded. I understood more than he did how I would be riding a fine line during those battles. One misplaced shot could kill a warlock, and then I'd be screwed. Thinking of that, I chuckled. Hey, it's a good thing I got that crown. It'll maximize my margin of error. Yes, I suppose that makes it perfectly timed. You're lucky, so use that. Make your decision and understand the consequences. If it were up to me, I simply wouldn't participate. Well, at least now I wouldn't. Back then, I suppose I was quite reckless like you are. I'm not reckless. I'm just spontaneous. Call it whatever you want, just don't get killed for it. That's all I have to say. Sure. Thanks. I'll at least be careful. I waved with that, leaving the study and heading back to the hotel. When I arrived at my room, I smelled a nice aroma mixed with a healthy dose of smoke. My brows raised as I turned the corner, looking into the kitchen where Amara was handling a pan with tall flames lashing out of it. She looked back at me, flustered. I am sorry. I don't know what happened. The fire just got worse when I put water on it. That's called a grease fire, dear. Did you turn the heat off? Yes. All right, let me see. I walked over and saw that she was attempting to fry something. Whatever it was planned to be, it wasn't anymore. So I took the pan and grabbed a cap. Once I quickly clamped down the cap, the flame was smothered and gradually went out. She looked over, brows raised. Huh, that was easy. I've taught you this before. What does a flame need to grow? A uh, fuel, heat, and oxygen. Yes, that. If a fire doesn't have one of these things, then it goes out. What I just did was block the flow of air to the fire, smothering it and making it go out. You could do the same with a blanket or a towel. I uncapped the pan as I said that, letting all the smoke flow out. It was intensely pungent with my new sense of smell. Amara nodded. I see. So a fire can be put out simply by cutting off oxygen. Most of the time it can, but not always. This one could, and you also could have put it out yourself simply by making a vacuum around the pan. That would get rid of all the air, and the fire would have simply disappeared. Because a flame is what? It's just a gas undergoing combustion. So wait, can vacuums combat all flames then? Theoretically, most flames that you normally encounter. Yes. Hmm. She went silent in thought as I started cleaning up. Once I had cleared most of the filth from the splattering grease, she looked back over. Congratulations, by the way. Haha. Uh -huh. Thank you. I'm finally closer to your guy's level. How big was the advancement? My mind is about five times as fast compared to before. It's difficult to put a number on it. As for my psychic capacity, I'm not entirely sure since I'm running low after breaking through to the new dimension. But I'll know tomorrow. That's great. Any new weapons? Loads. This tournament is going to be fun. I smiled and grabbed any salvageable food that was left. Thankfully, this fire had only started after she was almost done with dinner. Amara sighed while helping set the table. I still can't believe you were forced into the tournament. Then again, you seem like you're going to have some fun with it. Oh, but I am. I got some exotic weapons that my enemies will particularly enjoy. Yeah? Like what? You'll see. I want it to be a surprise. I chuckled a bit as we sat down to eat. Combined with the crystal ball, I would have weapons that would really make me seem like a wizard. Maybe people would start questioning if I was actually a warlock. For now though, I decided that I wouldn't bother trying to start the next formation. It was time to focus on other things that would actually help me, like training and searching for more weapons. Which is what was on my mind when it came time to go to sleep. Well, that and how Amara and I smothered each other with our tongues for about an hour before going to sleep. Chapter 114. Reflect. The next day after my advancement, I followed the others to training. When we arrived at the grounds, quite a few of the other elites were there. I let the rest of my group go on ahead while I went over to speak with the puppet master. Pontek Goliard was the largest threat. He would almost assuredly trounce most of his division. I would need to train the most to counter him. Of course, he wouldn't be the only one. Although I had plenty of experience in the trenches, none of my enemies there had been very competent, especially not on the level of those at the Magisterium. One could argue that age and experience did more for those in the black market, but sheer power didn't care much about experience, and that was the most pressing problem here in the Magisterium. Warlocks had a plethora of spells that could easily turn me to paste. Whether it was suppressing me with an unceasing barrage of water or trying to cook me alive with fire, they were just as capable of killing me as knights were. It was just that knights were harder to kill in response, making them a bit more dangerous. Even then, depending on how it was looked at, the sheer variety of attacks a warlock could throw at me made a case that they might be more dangerous than knights. 
The situation I was in dictated that I couldn't kill anyone, so options that might have worked in the black market were limited. All of my weapons were solely designed and devoted to killing people as efficiently as possible. I would be going into a match completely at odds with my nature, which is why my new crown would be playing such a large role. The only reason I couldn't easily incapacitate someone was due to my own imprecision. Shooting someone's leg or arm would easily give me the win. The issue was, I had to be able to hit them with a small enough margin of error so as to not risk killing them as well. While a normal bullet might kill in a minute if I nicked an artery, I never had a chance to exactly examine the degree of damage a psycha enhanced bullet might deal. All I knew was the sheer trauma caused by a hit easily downed even scourge beasts. My aim was good, but I wasn't perfect. It was easy to hit unsuspecting targets, even easier with stationary ones, even at great distance. I'd have my fair share of experience with hitting moving targets in the trenches, so that experience would be coming into play. But that was also without regard to the health and safety of the other party, because why the hell would I bother? Now, I needed to combine my ability to adapt my aim as well as the precision that came with distance shooting. I had a feeling that time dilation would be a major factor, and that just made me appreciate my advancement even more. After waking in the morning and feeling my replenished psycho reserves, I found that it had actually been multiplied by an entire five times. That was a massive boost in strength, especially in combination with the hard-to-quantify increased density of Psyche. Still, my increased speed of thought as well as my larger reserves meant that I would be able to utilize my coat's abilities to a greater degree. It really was the perfect tool to have. I couldn't imagine the trouble I'd have to go through without it. And perhaps Maxwell knew that all too well, which was precisely why he gave it to me. Of course, my weapons, coat, and crown weren't the only tools at my disposal. Aura was probably my greatest lifeline at this point. Not even my coat could beat it, although the number of times they had saved my life were probably tied. Nonetheless, my aura and the abilities it afforded me would form the basis of my style of combat. It would be my sole decision maker in combat scenarios. But not only could it give me the demo version of precognition, it would also allow me to play some tricks on my enemies. I hadn't used the ability since there weren't many situations where it would be effective, but the ability to disrupt the minds of others was both valuable and something I was very much capable of. I had already done it with Apocryon. There was no reason I couldn't do it with everyone else. Now, I would finally get to put its efficacy to the test. Of course, some practice was in order. For that I would need to employ actual people instead of the puppet master's puppets, like my friends. But for everything else, the training grounds would be sufficient, especially since the puppet master apparently had a puppet that could fight similarly to Pontech. I was sure something like that was valuable, but I couldn't bet everything on its accuracy. I had my training plan. I would train to mesh my shooting skills together in the scenarios the puppet master prepared me and pull aside my friends to hone my aura. It would benefit them too anyway, so it was a win-win. And so the first day of training began. Once at the training grounds, I decided to have the puppet master give me some warlock opponents. His puppets weren't limited to beastly behaviors and appearances. They could take on the form of humans, and he could have them operate with decently intelligent behavior. More importantly, they could utilize a large variety of spells, giving me valuable experience against all sorts of opponents. Without delay, I was sent into my own training area. Apparently, it was modeled exactly like the tournament arena, a large stone platform about 100 square meters large. They were actually giving us a pretty massive area to work with which allowed me to keep my distance rather well. There weren't very many rules or restrictions on armor. This naturally meant that nobles could buy their way to victory with some super expensive armor, though there were some upper limits that ensured the tournament was still a tournament. As for tools or external weapons, those couldn't be used so freely. Surprisingly, my coat could be used without issue. That was a headache preemptively taken care of. Besides that, things like Amara's disposable weapons and tools couldn't really be used. It was all up to the discretion of the judge. Thankfully, I didn't use any of those. The only external items I had were my medicinal things. So I entered the arena how I would every other battle, facing off against a faceless puppet with some robes and a staff. I could still get injured here, but it naturally wouldn't be trying to kill me. The puppet and I were placed on opposite sides of the arena, 100 meters away from each other. And once the battle started, I immediately equipped one of the new weapons in my arsenal a rather famous weapon that I had actually fired once before on Earth. The M1 Garand. It fired the same .30-06 cartridge as the Springfield, but was semi-automatic instead of bolt action. 
that made it significantly more suitable for anything that required more than one round in a short amount of time. It also carried eight rounds and could be loaded with a single clip insertion instead of having to fumble around with multiple stripper clips. Once the rifle appeared in my hands, I lifted it and took aim through the iron sights. Of course, in that period of time, the warlock before me erected a shield. I immediately fired when I saw that, not bothering to further correct my aim. The gun cracked, kicking back into my shoulder. Sure enough, the shield ate my bullet, though flickered in the process before the warlock doubled down on it. Seeing that, I continued to fire, dumping a few more rounds into the shield while getting a feel for the new gun. Unfortunately, not even all eight moderately empowered bullets could break the shield. Once I heard the dick-hardening ping of the empty clip, I started reloading. With my enhanced reflexes and speed of thought, it was shockingly easy to slot in a new clip with precision and throw the bolt forward. It took all of 1.5 seconds, and that was without any actual experience doing so. Oh yeah, this crown is going to pay for itself. I smiled and took aim again. But in the time I was reloading, the warlock had cast some spells. Three large fireballs trembled around it, growing a bit larger before flying toward me. I dove to the side, my hood appearing over my head. Two of the fireballs flew past me and exploded, but the third one exploded right next to me. Though I was a good bit away by then, the flames washed over my body. Everything was nullified by the coat except the force of expanding air, which pushed me a bit further than I had been expecting. I tumbled a bit, turning my fall into a somersault before rising to one knee and taking aim. Once centered, I fired more. Three fully empowered rounds flew out in short succession, and with the third round, the warlock's barrier shattered. It messed up the next spell they were casting, and in that time frame, I activated my coat and focused on my aim. I raised the sight a bit and found the warlock's shoulder. It was around 90 meters away, and I was using iron sights. Normally, I would have found it a pretty difficult shot. But this time, my eyes finally demonstrated their uncanny value. My sight zoomed in through the iron sights. My target painted like it was right in front of me. The iron sights may as well have been a 20x magnification scope the way I was using them. I was easily able to twitch my barrel in line, pulling the trigger before the warlock could recover. An explosion ripped forth from the end of my barrel, and I watched as the bullet tore through the warlock's shoulder and ripped half its arm off. The staff, still tightly gripped by muscles that hadn't quite gotten the severe trauma message, dropped with the limp limb, the warlock clutching its shoulder as soon as it registered the loss of its limb. I lowered my sights, the puppet freezing and disintegrated in front of my eyes. Pretty good. The match would be called as soon as you made a shot like that. You'd also piss off anyone related to that warlock for destroying his arm. The puppet master appeared, standing a few meters away from me. I stood back up as my hood retracted. What else am I supposed to do? Warlocks are weak, unlike knights. Even the weakest weapon in my arsenal will tear them a new asshole. I know. I wanted you to give this competition an honest shot, but I didn't say it would be pretty. At the very least, all the participants will be offered free healing, and limbs can be reattached. You'll become a bit more infamous, but it'll be a necessary evil and I'll do my best to dampen the backlash. So long as you don't kill anyone, then it's out of my hands. Yeah. So as long as the wounds can be healed, I should be fine. Yes. And we'll have some of the best healing warlocks available for it. Injuries are common and families don't want their children to die in some game like this. So it's a given there will be adequate treatment. If you can continue to do what you just did and keep it to the limbs, then you'll make things much easier on us and yourself. Well, you'll certainly be working for it. I sighed a bit. A shot like that would be enough to incapacitate them, to say nothing of the pain. Of course, if they insisted on continuing despite that, then I would just give them another one. There was always another limb to convince them with. It would require great precision on my part. Thankfully, it seemed I was more than capable of it. Legs are easier to hit anyways. Whatever you need to do. However, that warlock right there was only an authority 5. I'll give you an authority 6 now, then an authority 7. I want you to have to fight for your well-being in the event you actually have to. I've trained some competent warlocks, that much I can assure you of. Give them to me. I want to see how my experience from the trenches compares. TSK, still can't believe you fought in that place. He muttered while vanishing, another puppet appearing on the other side of the arena. A level above, and given how the puppet master wanted me to fight for my wins, none of them would be stupid. Sure enough, once the battle started, it immediately put up a thick barrier a magnitude sturdier than the previous one. I lifted my garand and started firing, using fully empowered shots without inhibition in order to start whittling it down. 
That was all I could do. Bullets were particularly effective against warlock barriers due to their size and penetrability. I've battled some warlocks where my bullet pierced their barriers without actually breaking it, meaning that the magic wasn't without its obvious weaknesses. After all, they were primarily meant to defend against other spells, or at the smallest, melee weapons. No matter what, they were not designed to handle the unfamiliar type of damage my bullets inflicted, which gave me a great advantage. Still, so long as it had any reasonable amount of mana behind it, a barrier would eat bullets like candy. Nothing would get through, and they would just sit there like a bunker and launch spells like a turret. What I had to be careful about was not challenging the warlock during the time they were casting spells. I watched as some air warped, my psyche picking up mana formations in the atmosphere, and my new eye seeing air blades hurtling toward me. They were fast and sharp, so right as my head formed over my head, I utilized my speed of thought and control over my body to deftly dodge between two blades. My body tilted backward as I stepped forward, both blades sliding past my limbs and slicing into the stone underneath, leaving gouges where they disappeared. New spells were already being prepared by the time I had regained my footing. When I saw those formations, part of me wanted to just wait and dodge again. But that was a deadly cycle to fall into. I wasn't a knight and definitely not faster than those spells. If I allowed a warlock to launch spells without contest, then the only ending was defeat or death. I needed to challenge them, no matter how token the resistance was, and I needed to do so consistently. Damaging a warlock's barrier drained their mana, so even if the battle became one of attrition, I could still do something. So instead of getting ready to dodge the next wave, I decided to run forward. I sprinted as fast as my legs would carry me in a straight line toward the warlock. After another couple seconds, I had managed to cover 20 yards and got ready for the next set of air spells. Six blades of air appeared and flew toward me, all of them closing in from the front. In response, I shifted my momentum laterally and waited for the right time. Right when the blades were going to collide with me, I threw my body to the side and let them all fly past me. I rolled once and popped back up to my feet, continuing my sprint and covering another 50 yards before the next spells were coming. But I stopped at that distance, a grenade appeared in my hand. Pin already pulled. This was the MK. Two-hand grenade, a basic fragmentation grenade, and positively loaded with Psyka. Right when the spells were launched at me, I tossed the grenade, the chunk of metal and explosives rolling to its feet as I dodged another set of blades. It was surprisingly easier to do at close range. I missed the explosion as I was rolling, but popped back to my feet with my rifle shouldered, catching sight of the warlock through my iron sights. And surprisingly, he was missing a few chunks of flesh from around its body, particularly the abdomen and legs. The warlock collapsed before freezing and disappearing. The puppet master appeared again. A bit overkill, though effective. Use something like that early on when the barrier has enough to resist it. Then you'll deplete a large chunk of mana while weakening it for a short period of time. If you're fast enough, you can break it with your gun and shoot the person behind it. Good to know. Are wounds like that too much? Depends. There were a few chunks of metal inside its body, and considering the damage to the organs, it would be more difficult than normal to keep them alive. Those metal chunks do incredible damage on the way in. Well, that's what they're built for. I'll keep it in mind. Though I'm starting to think you need to increase your medical personnel. Maybe you're right. Focus on damage control first, though. I just want to make sure you make any mistakes like this here first rather than in the arena. Right. I nodded, the next enemy being prepared as the puppet master left. It was another authority six, but this time, it used both air and fire spells. The two elements were used in tandem, proving particularly difficult to dodge. I found myself having to close a surprising amount of distance as the warlock deftly darted out of my way with air at its feet. No longer was range necessarily to my advantage. Of course, that was only to use my grenades. Warlock barriers only had a certain amount of mana loaded into them, depending on how much the warlock had loaded beforehand. But it would never be a majority of their mana. This was yet another advantage I could use. Not only were barriers susceptible to penetrative power, but they also had limited fuel. This meant that an explosive amount of power hitting the barrier at a small point was the perfect recipe for breaking them down. Grenades were naturally good at that job. Of course, I might kill the warlock in the process if I went overboard. But that's what this training was for. I needed to find the sweet spot and gauge their power properly, so I knew how powerful of a grenade I could use, and when. Of course, grenades were only one tool among many. I had plenty of time and energy, so I tried everything I could think of. With each battle, 
another weapon was brought out. Sometimes I used grenades, other times I brought out my Lewis gun. The Lewis gun was currently the best machine gun in my arsenal that could be held and fired. I had found others, but those needed to be mounted and were stationary. They weren't very fitting for my current situation. Of course, I had also tried to look for some other particularly famous machine guns, but the one I had my eye on couldn't yet be found. At some point, I would get my hands on Hitler's buzzsaw, but that time wasn't now, so I needed to make do. The Lewis gun I found had good handling anyway, and I could fire it in bursts to maintain accuracy. I found it good for suppressing the warlock and forcing them to continue channeling mana into the barrier or risk it breaking. I wasn't the only one who could get caught in a deadly loop. Barriers were nice, but they apparently weren't very versatile. The warlocks could move around while using them, but that only took more mana and concentration. And it wasn't like I couldn't simply adjust my aim, so running like a rat only helped me. There were plenty of ways that I could suppress and beat a warlock, especially if I got the drop on them. But situations were dynamic and the puppet master didn't like letting me have my way. So I was frequently put into sticky situations and my acrobatic skills were put to the test. That training went on for hours. I took some breaks to process things and reflect, holding several discussions with the puppet master as well. He was controlling the puppet directly so he knew best how to correct things, given that unique perspective. His insight had unquestionable value. I was taking everything I could get. Going into this tournament unprepared would be no different from sending myself to jail. Of course, there was one thing that actually made battles much easier than they otherwise would be. As proven time and time again, my coat was way too powerful to be damaged by anything at or below Authority 7, unless it was a knight trying to crush me with a blunt weapon. That was why I found knights to be so much more of a threat than warlocks. When it came down to it, only knights were really capable of hurting me. Everything else could be tanked by my coat relatively easily. Of course, there were always exceptions. Earth magic happened to be one thing I needed to pay particular attention to. But besides that, I could rest easy knowing that basically everything thrown my way by a warlock couldn't actually hurt me that badly. It afforded me great leeway. And so, the first day of training ended. We decided to train more with warlocks the next day as well. So in the meantime, I just needed to rest and reflect. Chapter 115, Completely Alien The next day of training came, and I was back to facing warlocks. The night before, I had discussed some things with Amara, getting her insight on how warlocks operated. She provided me with some weaknesses as well as the thought process behind her decision-making. Warlocks were just as fragile as summoners. The only reason they weren't seen as that weak though was because, unlike summoners, their magic could actually protect them. But that also meant they had a singular point of failure, their barriers. As she had told me before, barriers were only loaded with so much mana at any given time, a quantity that changed when damaged or according to the warlock's wishes. My bullets and grenades could outright bypass some of those defenses with penetrative power and rapidly shatter the integrity of the spell. Barriers, as described by Amara, were one large active spell formation. So disrupting the spell meant disrupting the barrier. However, good warlocks could also shift the power distribution, allowing for variable strength in different areas of the barrier. Warlocks from the Magisterium were taught spherical barriers that provided omnidirectional protection but they were also taught how to shift the power concentration, so I could count on definitely facing that. This worked against me in two ways. Not only would my bullets be less effective, but I also couldn't adapt to it. If I placed a grenade behind them while shooting from the front and they failed to perceive the threat of the grenade, it would just kill them. I had plenty of ways to kill a warlock. Keeping them alive while crippling their ability to fight back was something else entirely and magnitudes more difficult. Right now, I was the icon of the industrial war machine, and it was spitting out some of the deadliest tools of wrath that Earth's history had ever seen. And I was being forced to rein it in and direct all of that explosive power into measured, non-lethal attacks. That was like trying to train a bunch of hungry rapid wolves to capture a rabbit instead of just tearing it in half, chewing it up, and shitting it out. But it could be done, in part by not using the rabid wolves, but bloodhounds instead. I needed to use the precise tools instead of explosive ones and I needed to understand how my enemy thought in order to corner them. But that meant battles would take time, and such time was putting my cardio to the test. Once I was back on the training grounds, the puppet master threw some Authority 7 warlocks at me. These warlocks weren't operating like true Authority 7s. He just wanted to make the barriers tougher to break and the spells more varied, giving me more of a challenge. But after just a few hours of fighting, I was stumped. 
A warlock at that level could tank all my shots while also using spells to simply run away when I closed the distance. Not only that, but their spells were fast and powerful. I couldn't even do anything to them. Of course, the puppet master understood that. Sometimes I thought he was having me do a cardio workout instead of actual combat training. Either way, I realized where my limits lay and what to do when a warlock was really good at one particular thing. The staffs they used helped them buffer spells, which meant that the good warlocks were able to cast multiple spells at once and in quick succession. If you let them, they would throw a constant barrage at you with no rest, all while being mobile. Of course, the downside to this was the fact that the barrier was neglected, making them a weaker target. Against that, I could only stress myself to find a shot while constantly dodging and moving. During a battle against one opponent, I had only half a second to take a shot, and that was while taking a pressurized ball of water to the leg. That left a nice bruise, even through my coat. So I continued to rack my brain for solutions. I didn't want to be helpless and resigned to constantly dodging, but that seemed to be all I could do. Or at least, until I thought of something. After that, it all seemed so obvious. Barriers were spell formations, and my bullets could affect that spell formation. The fact that I could pierce through barriers was evidence of that. If my psycho were unable to affect mana, then my empowerments would do nothing to help me break barriers in the first place. So why the hell wouldn't it do that to every other spell formation? Although launch spells were just clusters of an element, they still relied on formations to keep them together and guide them with a specific purpose, so psycho could still affect it. With that logic in mind, I put it to the test. Standing across from the warlock, I panted in exhaustion. I had already run a lot in the past few hours, and I was getting sick of it. But now, my veins pulsed in excitement as the warlock created its barrier. I stood there and brought out another new gun. Called the Remington A-5, it was the first semi-automatic shotgun ever created and a weapon that John Moses Browning considered to be one of his greatest achievements, and for good reason. This model was chambered in 12-gauge, like most shotguns, and it handled like most shotguns with a tube-fed system. But that semi-automatic system was way too attractive to continue to use the trench gun, despite the satisfaction of slam fire. So when I discovered it, I communed with the responsible spirit immediately. I watched as four fireballs hurled toward me, raising the shotgun and firing as soon as they crossed the 50-meter mark. The stock slammed back into my shoulder. A brass casing spun off to the side. All the buckshot that flew out the front was empowered and aimed right for the fireball. And I watched as the fireball was blown up, all of its power being disrupted and detonated mid-flight. The rest scattered as the spell formation holding it together was destroyed. I smiled even as I shot the other three, all of them being snuffed out like the first. The warlock across from me stood there, frozen for a few seconds until the puppet master appeared. I smiled at him without a word, causing him to scoff. Whatever. It's not like there's ever been a cold summoner capable of doing what you just did, so I didn't know it was possible. I guess it should have been obvious, though. It's a good thing you found out about it. Fuck yeah. Hmm. Well, I'm suddenly far less worried about how you'll handle warlocks. Still, I'll make sure you can handle different varieties. Fuck yeah. I responded with an even wider smile. He was right. This just made things a lot easier. After that, I gotta do a little skeet shooting as spells were constantly flung at me. They came in batches and each one was a different type from a different element. From fire, to water, to air, all kinds of spells were hurled at me in just as many varied forms. The only thing limiting me was my reload time. There were no such things as speed loaders for shotguns at the time, so I had to make do with hand-loading shells. However, that was exactly what my crown helped with. I resorted to practicing loading two shells at a time. Without needing to grab them from a belt, I could simply have them appear in my hand perfectly oriented for insertion. Then all I needed to do was shove them in repeatedly. It might have seemed unnecessarily complicated, but I still couldn't simply will the shells into the tube. That seemed to be a feature I was incapable of, at least until I figured out why and how to bypass it. Regardless, the A-5 could hold four shells in the tube and one in the chamber. So long as I left one in the chamber, I could just load four with two swipes of the hand and continue shooting. That meant I had four shots before needing to reload. Of course, more than four magical projectiles could be thrown at me, so the strategy became shooting the ones I couldn't easily dodge and going from there. Threat assessment was key. Like that, the rest of the day was spent practicing my quick draw, reloading, and quick aim. I used both shotguns and rifles to shoot spells, but naturally shotguns were far more reliable. It was like shooting birds, and birdshot was in fact better suited for the spells. 
one issue was now resolved. Now, it was time to move on to the rest. When the third day of training came around, I had the puppet master give me knightly opponents. Unlike warlocks, knights were straightforward to fight, but also more difficult. I didn't have to worry about accidentally killing them. They were built to take hits, and the only way I could beat one was to dish out more hits than one could handle. That took sheer power and brute force, not so much precision. And even if I went overboard and given knight grievous wounds, they were tough enough to stay alive, and the doctors had more than enough leeway to heal them. Ever since that tooth and nail struggle with the royal, I knew that knights could fight even when half dead. For them, I needed to bring forth the full might of the industrial war machine, and the puppet master was good at drawing that out. It was exhausting, to say the least. I could now easily go toe-to-toe -to -toe with authority six knights, but doing so took a lot out of me. Not to mention that they were usually fast and strong, just like Pontek Goliard. It seemed like everything always came back to Goliard. I asked the puppet master to give me opponents as fast as Fiden and as strong as Vetmon, which seemed to be where Pontek lay. Though he couldn't quite match the extreme attributes of both, he wasn't far from it. The man really was a powerhouse deserving of his spot on the board. My main issue with fighting him would be maintaining distance, given his speed. Of course, with some suppressing fire and my aura, I could deter him from getting too close too fast. But I couldn't stop him, even if I was hitting my shots. It would be his victory if he got close. After that, it would take everything I had in order to keep myself alive, from the power of my coat to the fullest use of aura. Dodging was nearly impossible with that guy. He was too fast, and it wasn't like I was trained in martial arts. Five seconds trying to keep my life felt like an eternity, and, oftentimes, I couldn't make it any longer than that. I would reach my limits, and no amount of precognition or time dilation could save me from my comparatively lethargic body. So my goal was to keep as much distance between us for as long as I could while trying to put him down before he could reach me. It was difficult, but not impossible. My recent advancement meant that my bullets were more than capable of wounding him. Armor was a factor that could mitigate that significantly but I also had a way to circumvent that. For hours of constant battle with the dummy left me at the edge of exhaustion, but I called the training session to an end a bit early in order to work on something else. I finally met up with my squad, the five of us on a field for our own special training. Hey guys. John. How's training going? Eh, it's going. This is turning out to be harder than expected. I shrugged while clasping hands with Vetsmon and Fiden. Pontek is fast and strong, so if he gets close, I'm screwed. M.M. How difficult is it to bring him down before then? Difficult enough. Which is why I want to do this training. I need my aura to be sharper and I want to test out something new. Something that might help me keep my life against someone like him. Come here. I grabbed Fiden and pulled him over to the open field. Then, I stood about 15 meters away, the two of us squaring off. I want you to catch me. All you have to do is lay a hand on my body and you win. Utilize whatever means you can whether that's aura or your full speed. I don't want any handicaps. Hmm, all right. Amara, start us off. Fiden took up a stance as Amara raised her hand from the side. Ready? Go. Fiden flew forward as soon as she spoke. It was clear that he didn't bother holding back to see what would happen, which is exactly what I wanted. Because right when he did, I let my aura bloom, expanding out through the area like a thick fog. Like during my operation, I was able to see everything around me with great clarity, almost as clear as my eyes were, though with far more insight. I could see Fiden, the heat running through his muscles with every neural impulse, and his plans on attempting to catch me. Of course, his own aura attempted to blur his intentions, but my own had advanced so much that it didn't really matter. Like that, I infused my psyche into the fog of my aura, the power of the mind entering Fiden's body and affecting his psyche. Then, I started visualizing things that didn't exist. I stood completely still, yet imagined that I was moving to dodge. I almost convinced myself that I was actually moving even when I was sure I was standing dead still. And sure enough, I watched as Fiden veered to the side and dove at nothing. Halfway through though, when he realized something was wrong, he recovered and slid to a halt, turning back to me, seeing me in the same place as I was when we started. I looked at him, and then started running. Two Johns split off from the same location. It was difficult for Amara to tell which was the real one, though she wasn't quite worried about that. She was still shocked that this was happening at all. It seemed John had learned how to utilize illusions, a power she had only heard about before. Illusions couldn't easily be mimicked by magic. That was because it required one to not just project realistic images, but trick the mind. 
With Saika and Aura, it was much easier, yet few summoners ever learned to do so simply because they didn't need to. They couldn't fight, and so they didn't develop many combat-related techniques. This was the first time she was ever seeing something like this. A fog permeated throughout the area for a great distance, even enveloping them who stood on the sidelines. That fog was only from John's aura, and so it didn't actually disrupt their vision. They could still see both of them clearly, but the effect that his aura had on their minds created illusions of things that weren't real. They obscured John's body while creating other images of him that weren't real. Even they were tricked, because they had thought Fiden caught John the first time he dove forward. And after that, Fiden gave chase to multiple Johns, none of the ones he caught being the real ones. When he would catch one, it would disappear, as if his mind finally registered that it wasn't actually there. It would do so for the others too. But then, the Rayal John would release another illusion that Fiden had to try and differentiate against once more. None of them could seem to do it. They had faint feelings, but it was too confusing, and there was only one Fiden. He could only choose to chase one. And even if he made the right choice, John would just kill the other illusion and create another, forcing Fiden to make another decision that was likely wrong. So, in practice, he could never be right. The only way to fight against it was Aura, but none of them had an Aura as developed as John's. Not only that, but their minds weren't very resistant to Saika, which made his illusions all the more effective. Suddenly, the power of the mind seemed so incredibly powerful. All of them knew that summoners were weak. John was merely an exception. But when they saw this, they felt like summoners had unfathomable potential. Everyone was vulnerable against the type of magic they didn't wield. Knights were vulnerable to mana. Warlocks were vulnerable to vigor. But now, their friend had shown them just how vulnerable to Saika they were. Because of that, Fiden was unable to catch John for an entire 10 minutes. No matter what he did, he was always outmaneuvered. John didn't even have to stress himself physically, not nearly as much as he usually would in this situation. Finally, once he seemed to have enough of teasing Fiden, the fog receded and they all laid eyes on the real John. The moment the influence was gone, the illusions felt painfully obvious, and they doubted they could have ever mistaken them for the real John. Well, that was certainly fun. Too bad I can't use this against the puppets. He chuckled a bit and sat down. He was obviously tired since this wasn't his first workout. Fiden scratched his head in confusion. I'm not sure what the hell just happened. Illusions, my friend. If you want to avoid them, then you need to train your aura more. All of you do. Tomorrow, I want to train like this more. Next time, I'll also use my guns and see how that affects things. Still, just imagine not knowing where you got shot from. That's kind of scary. Tana shivered a bit, making John chuckle. Anyway, I'm tired. Maybe I can just sleep here. No, no, let's get back to the hotel. Come on, big guy. Amara walked over and hoisted John up, wrapping his arm around her shoulder. After saying goodbyes, the two walked off, leaving the knights to ponder to themselves. Fiden sighed. If Ponhak doesn't have a good aura, he's screwed. No kidding. John is already hard to catch. That just makes it impossible. Still, it's amazing how powerful he is. That's Mon rubbed his chin in thought. The level of aura he displayed was unreal. It made him question himself, thinking that aura couldn't possibly be so difficult to train if John was already doing so well. He hadn't even been training it for a year. All of them had been training since the young age of 16, like everyone else. They had years under their belt while John had less than one, yet he was already in authority five and had a far better aura. The growth was freakish. Completely alien. Almost. Chapter 116. Forfeit. After a night of rest, I was back at training. There were only a few more days before the first battle started. No matter how sure I was in my ability to take out a knight, in the event something didn't work out, I would need to have some insurance. That wasn't even accounting for Pontek. Worryingly, I didn't know exactly how developed Pontek's aura was, but I couldn't bank on it being worse than mine. Thankfully, it would at most be even, if not a little better. Any more developed, and he would be able to project vigor, which would complicate matters far more. I at least had assurance from the puppet master that he most likely hadn't reached that level yet. So for the rest of my training days, I simply focused on fighting knights and utilizing my illusory aura. I no longer pushed myself as hard against the night puppets, preserving more energy for training my aura. The additional time I managed to put in let me eventually play the game of tag with both Vetsmon and Fiden at once. However, that seemed to be the limit. I could make two illusions of myself indistinguishable from reality, but any more than that and the one subtle differences in aura between a clone and the original became painfully obvious. 
Not only that, the act itself of maintaining the facade took quite a lot of concentration. I had to devote my entire spark to maintaining one, and my mind to the other. I didn't have another spark yet to control a third. That was fine though, because I only really needed one for the tournament. Two was just good insurance in case I was in a really sticky situation. However, utilizing two illusions also made them both less real. The more mind power I could devote to one, the better. I also used my guns in tandem, which worked shockingly well. Nobody would know where the shot would come from until it was made. And since I had really good control over my intent and how much it leaked, it was impossible to tell which one was real even while I attacked. This was all to say that I was very prepared, and I still had more time to refine all my techniques. My illusions would only get better, to say nothing of my aura overall. And so, the last few days of training passed. I didn't bother going to the arena because nobody I knew was fighting. But that changed at the beginning of the next week. All of us received our letters the day before telling us when and where to meet for our matches. And so we went, all of us with our own battles to fight. Funnily enough, because nobody cared about the summoners, we had our own arena in one of the training fields. It usually wasn't a popular arena. However, this time, it was much more crowded. I had a feeling that was because of me. After entering the field, I made my way over to a check-in. From there, I just waited in the staging area, watching some of the battles before me. Sure enough, as was expected by literally all of humanity, there were no cold summoners fighting. Only hot summoners even had a chance since they actually summoned beasts and the like, so they didn't have to do any fighting themselves, or risk much of anything. Perhaps that was why it was also on the field instead of the arena. I didn't have any clue what these summons looked like, but I relaxed as I watched the beasts fight. Most of them seemed like normal animals. None of them were exotic like flickers or vicious like scourge beasts. Then again, they were all foreign in some way. If cold summons came from other worlds, then these animals probably did too. That meant it wouldn't look anything like normal animals from this world. Still, nothing particularly caught my eye. The main issue with summoners wasn't actually their summons, but their advancement formations. Each advancement was mediocre at best and made them all pitifully weak for their level. It simply wasn't on the level of Maxwell's, which was designed to push a summoner to authority 12 like the advancement paths for knights and warlocks. So these battles were really only cage fights. When one side's beast lost, that was game. The goal wasn't actually to harm the other summoner. Things would be far too easy for me. Though, I didn't expect what happened a bit before my turn came. A young man approached me with an entourage trailing behind, hesitantly walking over until he stood before me. I kept my relaxed posture as he spoke. John Cooper? My name is Max Ten. A pleasure to meet the most powerful summoner in the Magisterium. Hello, Max. I shook his hand. This Max was naturally a summoner as well, so his psyche made his thoughts a bit more difficult to read. But it wasn't enough to really stifle my own aura, so I could tell that he came here with a certain level of determination. This obviously wasn't just a spur-of-the-moment meeting. Sure enough, he sat down next to me. I'd like to extend a proposition to you. You see, we summoners within the Magisterium tend to stick together, being an oppressed minority. We have something like a club that focuses on our intellectual standing, which also provides many opportunities through our connections with a variety of businesses within the capital. First, I'd like to extend an invitation. We're called the Psychic Conference. I'd like to make you a member. You do understand that I'll be leaving when the year is over, right? My brows raised. I wasn't being rude. It was just that I had no more than a couple months left here. If I had started from the first or even third year, they might be worth checking out, and I might be worth something to them. Max smiled. Yes, I do understand that. However, I still extend the invitation because the conference can provide you with many valuable connections. We're all aware that a summoner's place is really only behind a desk as the thinker of many businesses. I also know that you're an exception who's exceptional at combat, so that might not be for you. But the battlefield is dangerous, so I'd like to offer this to you. Take it as an olive branch. Hmm, that's generous. Well, I appreciate the offer. I might drop by later and take a look. But if I may ask, why now all of a sudden? Well, this tournament is the main reason. I didn't actually come here just to extend an invitation. Allow me to lay forth my second proposition. Max glanced out toward the arena before looking back into my eyes. We at the conference have decided to forfeit all matches against you. This means you'll have no issue simply climbing to the top and taking the title of Summoner Champion. Oh yeah? Why? Heh. Yeah. He looked down with an aura of self-disappointment. Sir Cooper, we have no illusions about our power. 
You are currently the rank 1 elite, even over Pontek Goliard, someone who was supposed to be the most powerful person of our generation. The only other summoner within the elites is currently at the very bottom, and he doesn't even worry about combat anymore as he recently started working with a company. So it's not hard to realize that you would easily kill all of us if you wanted to, let alone win the summoner tournament. So, instead of competing against you, we want to support you. With our forfeitures, you won't be bored with these battles and can focus on training for what really matters. I'd even tell you not to show up at all, but the judges are sticklers and you'll have to at least show your face in the arena. Hmm. I nodded, looking out to where the last battle was finishing. I was next. Well, Max, I have three battles today and some friends to watch later. If you all really are doing this for me, then I'll take it with thanks. Of course. Please, go ahead. Rodern here is your opponent for your first match. After that, you'll have an hour to yourself. He motioned over to one of those within his entourage, Rodern nodding at me when I saw him. Sure enough, I was soon called. We both walked up onto the arena. Then, I forfeit this match. Hmm. The judge looked between us before sighing. Very well. Match forfeit. John Cooper is the winner. Your next match is in an hour. How convenient. I smiled a bit, walking back to the seats where Max was standing. He smiled back at me as we shook hands. You know, I'd like to fight at least one of you. I've never fought a summoner before. If you'd like, then we can figure something out for the championship battle. Nonetheless, all of us summoners have been fans of your achievements this year. The pride you've brought to the summoner class can't be understated. So we want nothing more than to help you succeed in the upcoming tournament. If this eases your burden even a little and helps increase the chances of your victory, then it'll be worth it. Oh, don't you worry about my victory. I'll be taking first place. Your confidence is quite inspiring. Then I look forward to witnessing the first summoner to be crowned champion. Our hands separated, and with that, we said our goodbyes. I left the arena, and since I had plenty of time, went over to the actual arena to find my squad. All of them had battles today. There were tons of people in the stands watching. It wasn't just students that were able to watch, but outsiders as well. The stadium was huge and handily accommodated everyone. Thankfully, there was a reserved spot specifically for the elites. I found the puppet master and Tana there. I went to her first. Hi, John. Hey, Tana. We shared a quick hug before focusing back down below. Right now, Fiden was on stage about to start his battle while Vetsmon was in staging. Amara was also in staging. How was your battle? I can't imagine those summoners made you break a sweat. No. In fact, they forfeited against me. Ah, oh, no wonder you were so quick. She nodded, looking back down. The battle between Fiden and his opponent started, but just as soon, it ended. Fiden dashed across the arena and simply overpowered his opponent. He didn't even have to try. His opponent wasn't even an elite. It took all of 10 seconds for the battle to end, and he walked right back into staging. Then, Betsman went up, but that ended just like Fiden's. Nobody could match Vetsman's strength. As for Amara, although Warlock battles were different, she couldn't possibly lose either. It took about a minute for her opponent to finally buckle. Unlike knights who could just overpower and put their enemy in checkmate with a blade to the neck, warlocks had to break through each other's barriers to eventually decide a winner. It took longer and required more energy, even if the enemy was weaker than you. But it was uneventful. Amara knew plenty of powerful spells and her precision was unmatched. She and Tana had the best auras on the team as well, so that only widened the gap. She didn't really have to try. Like that, all three of them came back to staging. That's when I went over to the puppet master. He scrutinized me. You arrived quickly. Were they that weak? They were, but that's not why. How come you never told me about the psychic conference? Because they aren't worth your time. You already know Son of Son Industries. That's about the best possible opportunity any summoner could ever pray for. So besides that, they have nothing else for you. HM, I guess. Why? Did they approach you? They did. And they said they would forfeit all matches against me, letting me just take the championship. HM, how generous of them not to waste your time. He nodded, making me smile a bit. You don't speak very highly of them. Of course not. Ever since you arrived, I can't seem to think highly of any summoner. It almost feels like they're making excuses. I mean, they're the smartest, and yet the weakest. How does that work? Yeah, I asked the same thing. But you know better than I do about all that crap. I just do what Maxwell tells me to. And you'll continue to do that. Another reason I didn't want you to go to that stupid conference was because, in all honesty, I want you to continue fighting. It's dangerous for you, and I know that. 
But even among the knights and warlocks, you're incredibly lethal. I'm pretty sure you were born to be a scourge hunter, and if you do things right, along with a little help, you'll do great things for humanity. So I can't let you get distracted by all that other crap like being a thinker behind a desk. That would be a terrible waste of your talent. HM, I appreciate the praise, but I don't think I'm going to be that great. I'll do what I can, but I don't know if affecting all of humanity is in the cards. At least not in the realm of combat. I shrugged. If I really put my mind to it, I could bring about an industrial revolution. That would surely affect all of humanity, and I wouldn't actually have to do too much. But affecting all of humanity in regard to fighting the scourge? I would have to be an authority 12 for that. I wasn't sure if I had it in me. But the puppet master just scoffed. Please. Sometimes I'm not sure if you're narcissistic or not. Just pick one, please. Because you seem to choose to be humble at all the wrong times. What? I'm just being realistic. Well, stop. Humility doesn't suit you. Now go play with your friends. He waved me off. And just at that moment, Amara, Vetsmon, and Fiden entered the suite. I clicked my tongue and just walked off, going to greet them and watch some more matches before the time came for my next battle. If it could even be called that. Chapter 117 Breaking Point As Max had promised, every opponent I faced in the arena forfeited their battles. I just had to show up for them to do so. Because of that, my days went by easily. There was a week of division battles, and I didn't have anything to do for any of them. My energy wasn't spent, and thus I was able to spend my free time training. None of my training deviated from what I had already been doing, even in the Auric department. It didn't take much energy on the part of my knights who were responsible for catching me, so they were able to continue training with me despite their battles, to say nothing of the benefits to their aura that they wanted. Like that, a few days passed and the final rounds came around. That's when the battles finally got interesting, and so my focus was on my squad who were fighting for their lives. The arena was no longer divided into two, but completely dominated by just one so as to better draw attention to the match. I sat within the suite, Vetsmon, Fiden, and Tana beside me looking down through the glass. On stage, we could see Amara standing across from her opponent. She had two battles left, and those who had made it this far were all elites. Amara was currently the top warlock in the elites. I had no doubt that she would win, but that didn't mean it wouldn't be hard fought. I was curious to see how she would handle it. Our scientific discussions had yielded fruit over time. Amara was enlightened in the air element, which meant that any and all spells or techniques that utilized that element came extremely easy to her. That made it easy for her to create new ones or modify existing ones. And she utilized the knowledge I gave her to do so. Our discussions, while often running off tangents, largely focused on concepts she could use. I taught her all about how the various states of matter interacted with each other, the properties of whatever elements I could recall information for, as well as special concepts she could take advantage of. There were so many topics we had gone over that the booklet she kept with her of all my scribbles and written text was at least six inches thick. I was thinking that I'd need to get her one of those orbs to stuff information into. However, no matter how much I helped, it was up to her to apply it. I couldn't make the spells for her, even though I wanted to. So all this time, she had been solely devoted to doing just that. This would be the place where its value finally saw the light of day. I looked down from my seat, my eyes zooming in until I can see the individual strands of her ashy gray hair. The ability, despite the few weeks I had to get used to it, still held an element of unfamiliarity to it, and so brought a smile to my face. 3, 2, 1, match start. The countdown for the start of the match blared through a magical speaker in the suite silencing conversations and drawing everyone's attention to the pair of contestants in the arena. Once the referee's hand went down, I zoomed out and saw Amara's opponent conjure a barrier. Amara did the same thing, and both simultaneously started forming spells. Right now, Amara was best with the air element. She had been training her fire element, but hadn't quite been able to advance to Authority 6 yet. Meanwhile, her opponent's fire affinity had been perfectly developed. Spell circles appeared in the air as they held their staves. Each element had its own unique markers within the spell formations, but I was still studying those with Amara's help, so I couldn't quite differentiate them just based on that. Soon enough, fire bloomed forth from the opponent's spell circles. As for Amara, she conjured an invisible dome around her. I could just barely see some of the dense vapors around her with the help of my magical sight. Six fireballs accelerated at Amara and her dome of air. She simply stood there, watching them as they crashed toward her with explosive momentum. Flames swallowed her dome of air when they made contact, 
washing over it entirely and holding for a few seconds before dissipating into smoky embers and floating off with the wind. Amara was left behind, and scathed and unamused. She suddenly smiled a bit, nodding to her opponent. Come on, I'm testing a new spell. Keep going. Her voice echoed, her opponent baffled by her audacity, the audience reflecting his shock. I looked at him as he started to grit his teeth. Fine then. Here. He raised his staff, another spell circle flashing into existence. This one was far larger, reflecting the efforts and time he put into it. Omara simply watched as he spent almost a minute adding formations and pouring mana into it. When it finally activated, a massive amount of fire started to congeal, being crushed down by mana into a massive lance of blue flame. It was clear that this singular spell was his best, his face was dripping with sweat, and his brows furrowed in concentration. Omara tilted her head and tapped the butt of her own staff on the floor, a spell circle flashing beneath her feet, connecting to the dome around its edges. I couldn't possibly discern what she had cast. Her opponent smiled, teeth gritted together in concentration. His tensed hands suddenly relaxed, and the spear of fire streaked toward Amara. The silence throughout the arena was suffocating. The tip spun, leaving behind a spiral of flame as it flew. For a second, I was honestly worried a bit. Amara was probably using vacuums to her advantage against the fire, something we had discussed when she started a grease fire in my kitchen. But flame was still a gas consisting of matter with mass. A lance like the one hurling toward her would easily punch through a vacuum barrier. Of course, I'd like to believe that she'd never make such a stupid mistake as to not factor that into her defense, but I couldn't be entirely sure, not out of doubt for her own intellect, but uncertainty in my instruction. Still, I could only watch as the lance collided with her barrier. And to my great surprise, I had no reason to ever doubt her. When the lance made contact with her barrier, the barrier's movement was finally exposed. The lance's tip was sliced away by powerful winds, being carried away along the length of the dome as it spun like a hurricane. Of course, the lance contained so much fire that the barrier was soon engulfed. The winds of the barrier carried all that flame like a star, turning Amara into a ball of fire. But all that flame was redirected, being snuffed out while simultaneously being blown away from her. After about 10 seconds, the last of the flame disappeared, expunged with the smoke by a rather theatrical blast of air. Amara appeared behind, completely unfaced. She was smiling. HM, it works really well. Hey. I chuckled a bit from the suite. I could tell how excited she was even while holding it back in a public place. After that, she flicked her finger, sending a bolt of air toward her enemy. It crashed into his barrier, shattering it before launching him a few feet away. Like that, the battle was finished. Vet's mom laughed from the side. Like she's toying with a child. Since when was she so powerful? What did you do to her, John? Making out with your girlfriend makes you stronger. You should get to it lest you get left behind. H how preposterous. Since when? Fiden eyed me as Vetsmon turned away flustered. I just rolled my eyes with a laugh. When Amara arrived back at the suite, we all got up to congratulate her. She gave me a kiss before suddenly explaining what happened. I used that vacuum stuff you told me about. I saw that. Effective, right? MM. Vulnerable to heavy attacks like that lance though. So I changed the barrier to redirect all the flame with pressurized wind while using the vacuum to insulate against heated convection currents. How ingenious. Any issues? A bit. It got kind of hot inside. All of that radiation still got to me so I had to duck under my robe a bit. Besides that though, it worked wonderfully. Your pure barrier didn't block the heat? I asked curiously. Amara had told me about the different kinds of warlock barriers, and the pure barrier was supposed to be the ultimate fallback. Mana had different elements, but warlocks still had access to the pure mana within their bodies. It was what they cultivated, and the process of gaining elemental affinities was merely the process by which they understood the different parts of mana so as to better utilize it. Pure barriers were barriers of pure mana. They were generally difficult to create, but here, at the Magisterium, they were the standard, the best protective measure for the best of the warlocks. They protected against any and all forms of magic. The only downside was that it took more energy across the board to defend against anything. Doing what Amara did and utilizing the properties of air to defend against fire was efficient and specialized. Using pure mana, however, was like using all four affinities to defend against fire. It didn't have any weaknesses or loopholes, but it was far less efficient. Regardless of all that though, Amara said that the radiant heat of the fire had gotten to her. Which, if she had been using a pure barrier, shouldn't have happened. Of course, then, the answer to why that happened should have been obvious. 
She scratched her head. I put the barrier down. Why not? I just wanted to see how well it would work. If I don't have to waste a huge chunk of energy to create it, then I don't want to. But now I know that I still need at least a weak barrier to protect against the radiation. What would block the radiation, by the way? The best thing is a solid material. But for fire, all you need is something that light doesn't travel through, even if it's a liquid. All right, I'll keep that in mind. She nodded as we went to sit down. Just then, though, Fiden stood. I have my battle coming up. Oh, we'll be watching then. Who is it against? Me. Tana suddenly stood, my brows rising. I then smiled. Hell yeah. I'm already going to lose. Well, with that attitude, you are. I stood, Tana looking at me with a less than enthusiastic face. I grabbed her shoulder, pulling her to the side a bit. Hey, why so down? You haven't even fought yet. The outcome is obvious. I was thinking about forfeiting so Fiden doesn't waste his energy. What? Fuck that. If you want to be all realistic, then fine, let's be fucking realistic. I looked her dead in the eyes. You're gonna go out there and do as much damage as possible. You might not have Fiden's speed, but you've got much more stamina than he does. That means you're going to be able to wear him out and whittle him down. You're going to push him to his fucking breaking point. He better be drenched in blood and sweat by the time you're done with him. And even if you come out with a loss, then at least you can look at his sorry ass getting carried off the arena and know that you earned your fucking spot. What if it affects his other battles? Who the fuck cares? If he's that weak, then obviously he couldn't handle you. The most important attribute of a knight isn't their speed, but their tenacity. So go put his to the fucking test. Go. I pushed her toward the door, her determination rising with every step as she left and didn't turn back. Fiden walked over, my hand grabbing his shirt. You better make her work for that shit. Yes, sir. Good. Fight hard. I smacked his shoulder, letting him leave. When I walked back over and sat between Amara and Vetsmon, I smiled. This is gonna be a great fight. TSK, I thought you were dead serious for a second there. Did you rile them up just for the show? Hey, two birds with one stone. Tana stops acting like a pussy and we get to watch a great battle. I shrugged at Amara, making her smirk as Vet Mon Hunt. That's my future girlfriend, you know. And that right there, my friend, was called Tough Love. I don't know what the fuck she was thinking talking about forfeiting, but I don't have no bitches in my squad. Besides, if she were really a quitter, then she would have been kicked off the squad already. She just needed some motivation. Kicked off. He asked with a bit of surprise, making me nod. Of course. The puppet master wanted to kick her off at the beginning of the year when I almost died. But I told him to let her stay and get better. And sure enough, she trained her ass off and earned her spot. So she's got the strength and talent. She just needs to get out of her own head. Hmm. He nodded a bit, looking back out to the arena. I suddenly looked over at Amara. So you know how making out makes you stronger? We should train. This is a public area, dear. That's never stopped you before. No, that's never stopped you before. You're right. Just a peck. Ack. She curled her neck as I plastered myself all over her face and collar. When I pulled back, she was bright red, and I was satisfied. I smiled while looking down, seeing Fiden and Tana stepping up to the arena. My smile had practically become perpetual at this point. They were both dressed in their normal armor, facing off against each other with the entire arena as their playground. Fiden with his spear, Tana with her sword. I watched both of them intently, wondering how they would handle this fight. I knew both of them would give it their all, especially Tana, but I wasn't sure how much experience either of them had fighting people. I could only assume Fiden had more based on his background. Well, I would know soon enough. Match start. The hand went down, and the two lingered for a second before darting off like arrows at each other. The first strike came, Tana slashing out and being parried by Fiden's spear. He then moved in with his momentum, his spear snaking toward her. She dodged with lithe agility, retracting her sword before kicking off his body and creating distance. They had a moment of reprieve before continuing. Tana knew her strengths pretty well. Her stamina was her best asset and provided the most value to our squad. However, because she didn't excel in strength or speed, her combat power was relatively low. That meant that any enemy she faced, she would have to chip away at. This required her to kite her opponent, diving in and out without getting hurt in the process. This naturally required a great level of agility as well. That was one of her strong suits. Unfortunately, Fiden used a spear which was basically built to keep an enemy at a distance, close enough to attack, far enough to make counterattacks a mistake. 
Tana only used a sword so she was at a range disadvantage. But she knew how to handle herself. During all our battles she was always on the outskirts, observing and planning before striking. She could read the flow of battle and the people within it. She knew how to find opportunities and exploit weaknesses. That went for her own squad as well. Tana watched everyone, and she knew her own team well. That meant that she could read Fiden like a book, as she could vets Mon and Amara. Perhaps even me. So she knew how to handle Fiden. That was shown clearly as Fiden received Nyx in his armor from her blade, while she remained entirely unscathed. Minute by minute passed. Compared to all the other battles before, this one seemed to drag on as five minutes of hit and run attacks passed. They were fighting, but there weren't many exchanges and no wounds. Five minutes turned into fifteen. Tana continued to bounce around, diving in with greater frequency as Fiden was forced to fend off all of her surprise attacks. Although she didn't seem to be capable of doing anything to him, Fiden was also incapable of going on the offensive. She would just slip away, and the flow of battle would be dominated by her once again. Of course, Fiden tried to make some bigger moves every so often, expending energy and utilizing his speed in an attempt to pin Tana down and deliver a decisive blow. But she always snaked away from them, always able to evade and retreat. And every bit of extra energy that Fiden spent was another advantage for Tana. And finally, the first to land a solid strike was Tana. As she dove in, Fiden was caught off guard as she burst out with her full strength and thrust her sword into the gap between his armor plate around the leg. A long slice was left behind, blood splattering across her sword in the ground. But Fiden was a quick thinker, using his elbow to deliver a blow to her overextended body, knocking her to the floor and bringing down his spear. Before the blade could reach her, Tana rolled out of the way, jumping to her feet like a startled cat and scurrying away. Tana sucked in a long breath, the two at an impasse for a moment before Tana dove right back in. She couldn't let up. She couldn't afford to let Fiden gather himself. She would need to press every advantage she got. She continued diving back in, the battle moving in her favor as the wounds continued to appear. Fiden couldn't utilize his energy whenever he wanted. He needed to wait for an opportunity that Tana rarely presented. It would only happen when she finally got tired, so until then, he had to be patient. Of course, that meant he was on the defensive the whole time. Even when she overextended to deliver a wound, Fiden was unable to do much. She was too agile, and with her aura, she could read him better than he could read her. It made it all the more difficult. As 15 minutes turned into 30, the audience started to grow bored. With Tana whittling Fiden down, it almost seemed like the winner was decided. Fiden wasn't landing any hits and was only accumulating wounds. Eventually he would fall. But over time, Tana started to get tired. They were both losing vigor with every exchange. Vigor was no different than Saika or Mana. Every magical thing a knight did cost vigor. Just like how every spell a warlock cast consumed mana and every summon a summoner brought out consumed Saika. Tana was definitely consuming more than Fiden was. He was just stalling. She was trying to inch her way toward an impossible goal. From the suite, I could see Tana reaching her limit. Maybe not her physical limit, but her mental limit. Although she was encouraged by my little speech, that didn't mean she liked the situation. I could tell that comparing herself to the rest of her squad was a sore spot for her. Maybe she had carried that all the way from the beginning of the year when the puppet master had blamed her for my near death. And she knew that she couldn't win against Fiden. He was smart like her, so although he might not have her stamina, that didn't mean he couldn't win. The perfect course of action was to do exactly what he was doing, which was to let Tana wear herself out and strike when she couldn't avoid him. That time was coming, and they both knew it. That kind of helplessness was no doubt suffocating. And from the suite, I could see the exact moment that Tana finally gave up. I stood. Let's go down there. I didn't wait for a response, running out of the room and heading down the stadium stairs. As I did so I could hear the audience starting to cheer as Tana started battling Fiden head on. That was a recipe for disaster, but she didn't care. Instead of diving in and out, Tana dove in, wounded Fiden more, but stayed. She started to try and fight him on equal grounds, pushing forward with all her might. She might not be as strong nor as fast, but with her aura, she was able to predict Fiden's behavior and adjust accordingly. It allowed her to compensate, and for a minute, Fiden was actually suppressed and beat down. Whether it was elbowing or kicking, utilizing her spare knife, or deflecting his spear with her sword, Tana used all avenues available to her in order to get in close and stay in close. She didn't do anything that would let Fiden create distance. However, right as we got down the stadium and arrived at the side of the arena, 
Tana's advantages went up in smoke. I watched almost in slow motion as Fiden let out a breath and lifted an arm, deflecting one of Tana's kicks and diving in, driving a fist straight into her gut. I saw his eyes through the thin gap of his helmet. Right now, he was treating Tana like a serious opponent, which is exactly what he should be doing. But that meant that when Tana was thrown away, he was able to ready his spear. After that, it was over. He thrust his blade forward, Tana noticeably panicking as the spear sliced through her armor and opened up a large wound on her leg. She tried to jump away, but Fiden didn't allow her to. He jumped in and continued delivering blows with his spear that she was forced to either evade or block with her sword. It was overwhelming. His training became evident as each move he made flowed together in a way that Tana simply couldn't fight back against. Her armor was almost stripped entirely off as Fiden's spear ripped it apart. She was avoiding his blows by an inch at most, pushing her aura's predictive ability to its max, yet was still suffering wounds. Blood had already dyed the white arena floor red, mostly from Fiden. Most had already dried by now, the minute quantities not holding enough fluid to stay that way for long. However, it now received a fresh dose as Fiden's wounds opened back up and Tana's own started to bleed profusely. Vigor had a nasty effect on the body that didn't allow wounds to heal in any way, constantly degrading them. I had experienced that personally, the scar above my ear would never truly heal. We watched from the side as Tana continued to get overwhelmed. Of course, Fiden wasn't much better off. His energy was leaving his body far faster than Tana's ever did. It meant that Tana could do nothing but sustain injuries. It only took a minute after that for her to fall. With a knee to the chest, Tana was thrown a distance away, tumbling across the arena floor. She couldn't even recover, coughing up some blood. I saw tears run down her cheeks. She was more frustrated than in pain. That much was obvious. At that moment, I heard Vetmon yell, Get up and fight. Come on. Stand up. His voice roared even over the audience. I recoiled from the sound, his demands ringing in my sensitive ears. Still, I watched as Tana pulled herself to her feet. I couldn't know what was going on in her mind, though knew she was definitely in a lot of pain. I had been in that situation a few times and knew what it felt like, even if I didn't know about the conflict within herself. She had wanted to quit before, just letting Fiden roll on through so she wouldn't waste his energy. Now, she was feeling exactly why she had wanted to do that. But as I had convinced her, it was a matter of principle. She'd feel even worse if she had done that. At least now, she knew that she was earning her spot, even if it wasn't at the top. Fiden took a breather as Tana stood. And once she was steady, he dove back in. It was already over, and this was the nail in the coffin. Fiden only had to fly over and make one last exchange with her before kicking her sword away with his foot and placing his spear against her neck. She stood there, defeated and in pain, before falling to her knees. The judge stepped forward. Match over. The winner is Fiden Desmus. The match was called. And as soon as it was, Fiden dropped to his knees, blood dripping down his armor in exhaustion. All of us jumped up onto the arena and ran over. Metmon went straight for Tana, as he should, and wrapped her up in an embrace while she cried. As for Fiden, I walked over and slapped his helmet. Good shit, dude. Other than your reflexes. You couldn't catch her for shit. Ugh. Yeah, fuck. He cursed while coughing. It was clear that, just as I had predicted, Tana would push him to his breaking point. His breath blasted heavily against my leg. He couldn't even hold himself on his knees, falling to the ground a few moments later. Thankfully, there were always medical personnel on standby. A group ran up and took both of them away. We followed, the puppet master appearing along the way. He pulled up to my side and asked. I thought she was going to forfeit. I convinced her otherwise. Well, that's quite unfortunate for Fiden. His next battle is supposed to be against Vetsmon in three hours. They would fight to face Pontek. Well, Fiden met his match. It's nothing Tana is obligated to worry about. Seems like Vetsmon is going to be fighting for the championship. M.M., I suppose. He shrugged. Something like this was normal in these tournaments anyway. Tana forfeiting would be abnormal. After that, we got to the medical room and watched everyone get treated. Vetsmon had one more battle, but that wasn't going to be anything eventful. So with that, we moved on to the final phase of the division tournament. Chapter 118, Complacent. Both Tana and Fiden eventually passed out in the medical room. Both of them were treated and allowed to sleep and recuperate. Knights recovered best while sleeping, as did all humans. But the effects for them were heavily exaggerated. With some potent recovery drugs in their system, their wounds healed at an almost visible rate. 
When I zoomed in with my eyes, I could actually see their flesh churn within the wounds, blood clotting and scabbing, and patches of flesh spontaneously growing. It was almost disturbing, seeing the sped-up healing process completely open to air. It was a freakish healing ability that I couldn't help but envy every time I saw it. Like how warlocks and summoners could regenerate their energy within a day, so too could knights. But unlike the other magi, their wounds also healed with their vigor. They would be battle-ready in less than 24 hours. I rolled my eyes when the doctor told us that. Afterward, Vetsmon headed out for his final battle. We went to watch it even though it was relatively uneventful. The opponent was the second knight on Pontex squad, someone going by the name Userin. He couldn't really handle Vetsman's overwhelming strength or defense. His attacks were rebuffed gracefully and his parries were smashed aside. Not to mention that, although Vetsmon was slow compared to Fiden, he was still fast. He'd been training against Fiden a lot, so at the very least he could handle those who were faster than him. That battle ended sooner rather than later. Amara stepped up a few matches after that to finish her last match. She got another hour of rest before heading up. Her opponent was a lesser-ranked warlock who was also on Pontex's squad. That girl had a perfect affinity for the water element and a partial affinity for the fire element. Apparently, she was working to become a healer. And although she was good, she couldn't really compare to Amara. Unlike me who had only just found out before, all warlocks knew that the formations behind their elemental spells could be disrupted. So no matter if it was a pressurized ball of water or a huge river, Amara was able to either destroy the spell before it reached her or counter it with her versatile air magic. Over the weeks before the tournament, we had been discussing ways for her to counteract each of the elements with her air magic. The fire element was most discussed due to their compatible properties, which was why Amara could so easily beat a fire warlock. But we had also discussed the water and earth elements. The earth element was both difficult and simple to handle. If Amara could suppress and corner an Earth Warlock, then she could win pretty easily. They would be forced on the defensive. On the other hand, if they knew how to utilize their strengths enough to counter her, then she would have a much harder time. As for the water element, that was a bit easier. Pressurized gases could be used to disrupt spells, and strong winds could handle area spells. Of course, water warlocks had the mass advantage. But Amara also had mobility. If you can't beat it, avoid it. That's the stance she took with her battle and before long, she had cornered her opponent. After that it was only a matter of time before she came out with the win. And when the last blow was delivered, she was declared the winner. With that, we were done for the day. Well, Fiden technically had his battle against Vetmon. But since he wasn't even conscious, it was a loss by default, and Vetsmon moved on for his final battle. And of course, all of my opponents forfeited, allowing me to do the same. When all was said and done it was later in the day. Amara and I stayed in the medical room with Vetsmon and were there when Tana and Fiden woke up. Fiden was first, and we greeted him as soon as he sat up in his bed. Hey dude, how are you feeling? Sore. Everywhere. How's Tana? She's fine. MM. Good. Honestly, I didn't even know she could do all that. He let out a strained breath, recalling the battle's events. I chuckled. Hell yeah, she made you work for that win. All she needs is to get out of her own way. She's talented as hell. She's going to be just fine. Agreed. If she wins her battle tomorrow, she'll be getting fourth place. That's an amazing placement. MM. And speak of the devil. I suddenly looked over, sensing Tan awake. She groaned softly as her eyes fluttered open. Betsmon sat on her bedside, brushing a few blonde strands of hair out of her face. Ugh. Betsmon. Hey. How are you feeling? I tired, I guess. She groaned while pushing herself to sit up, but it proved to be a mistake. She flopped back down onto the bed, wheezing from exertion. She was obviously healing for more than Fiden. Damn. It's like I don't even work out. Just relax. We're in the medical ward. Your last battle is tomorrow, so you have plenty of time. Right. I don't know if I even care anymore, though. She let out a long breath before slumping to the side, leaning against Vetsman's body. My eyes widened, as did Vetsman's. I started flailing my arms right after and caught Vetsman's attention. He gave me a strange look as I pointed at Tana and then ran over to Fiden's bedside, scooting in close before wrapping my arm around his shoulder. Fiden tried scooting away, but Vetsmon got the hint and did as I demonstrated. His arm lifted and went around Tana, and she adjusted naturally, laying against his chest. I leaped up and started bouncing and flailing around in silent excitement. Was I mistaken and Tana wasn't nearly as dense as I thought she was? Did Vetsmon manage to finally woo her? I continued dancing around 
shaking Amara a bit, until Tana's head lifted. That's when I suddenly stopped and smiled at her. Hey, sleepyhead, that was a hell of a show you put on. It hurts like hell. My body felt like it was going to explode, but it was fucking worth it. I mean, look at what you did to my boy here. I shook Fiden, eliciting a grunt from him and getting a small smile from Tana. He actually had to be carried off. That arena had his blood painted all over it. And who did that? I did. Sorry, who did that? I did that. Fuck you, you did that. And to think you wanted to forfeit. Like I said earlier, I ain't got no bitches on my squad. Us five right here are the baddest motherfuckers in the Magisterium. Who can compete with this? I motioned around, everyone smiling a bit in pride. And it was true. Pontek wasn't even the top elite anymore. Myself, Amara, Vetsmon, and Fiden all occupied four of the top five ranks, while Tana had recently crossed into the top ten. We were simply better. Our relationships were also fantastic. Two couples and Fiden who had a girlfriend resulted in just about the best group relationship one could ask for. The best strength, the best chemistry, and plenty of talent left to unearth. Nobody could compare. I slung my arm around Fiden and leaned back into the headrest, my piece having been said. Amara chimed in at that moment. Now we just need to worry about Pontek. That's Mon will win. I don't have your confidence. The big man chucked from across the room, making me roll my eyes. Like I said to Tana, you won't win with that attitude. You need to go in expecting to win. It won't be easy, but you will. I can't expect something so unlikely though. Pontek is better. He's strong, fast, and his technique sits at a higher level than mine. I hear he's close to achieving projection. That's the Vigor Blade release thing? Yeah. Well, he doesn't have it yet, so it doesn't matter. It does. His aura is assuredly better than mine, not to mention everything else. My chances of actually winning are slim to none, no matter what I do. You're being too pessimistic, friend. I'm being realistic, friend. Our voices fell into a few moments of silence. Vetsmon and I stared at each other, our visions clearly conflicting. I was realistic too, and I knew that Vetsmon had a really low chance of beating Pontek. I had fought against a Pontek clone more times than I'd like to remember, and he was definitely a level higher than Vetmon. The fact that he was close to what Shadowbane had only just accomplished meant he was incredibly talented, more than any other knight I'd met, and definitely more so than Vetmon if the rumors were true. Granted, he was also on his way to Authority 7, but the point remained. He was significantly better than most of his peers. What that meant for his aura as well meant that Vetsmon likely wouldn't have a chance. However, like with Tana, I didn't believe going in with such a pessimistic attitude was any good. It was only counterproductive. You could take your opponent seriously while still having confidence. Just because you acknowledged them didn't mean you couldn't win. And telling yourself that you would win was a good way to keep you psyched for the battle. Putting yourself down only hurt you. Mentality affected performance. That was something I discovered during my time on Earth playing football. I had only learned that lesson when we won our first championship, something that should have been impossible, yet we had accomplished anyway. This was a competition just like that. It was better to fight knowing you would give everything, fighting to snatch that trophy, rather than believing otherwise and holding back. Which led me to my only rebuttal. I shrugged. Fine then. Just forfeit. What? You heard me. You're about to face another knight that only you and Fiden can stand shoulder to shoulder with. You're about to fight for the championship. So if you don't believe you're going to win, then why fight? If the result is already set in stone, then don't bother. I can still fight, even if I'm not expecting to win. I can test myself. There are still several benefits to be had from the battle. What a sorry excuse. A sorry purpose, actually. Why don't you just come out and say you're a pussy? He went silent, frowning while leaning forward. I almost wanted to chuckle, but I maintained my poker face for the sake of seriousness. I'm sorry. I don't understand. In what fucking universe am I the pussy? The one where you're scared shitless by the thought of losing honestly to Pontek. I can see it in you. There was a point in my life when I would make up the same bullshit. You're scared, because if you entered that arena expecting to win, giving everything you had to do so, and still lost, you'd be devastated. It would be humiliating, because all of your friends and family, both here and back at the Holy See, would see it and realize you weren't the best. So you make up some sorry fucking excuse to somehow preemptively spare yourself from that. Please, I don't fear anybody, especially not some Pontek. But that doesn't mean I can't acknowledge that he's better, and that in a fight, I might not win. Again with the excuses. How fucking so? Because whose fault is it that you're not better? I finally sat up as well, 
waving to him. I don't know what kind of training Pond Ek has, but you were trained at the Holy See. Your father is the head of the Verga family. A background doesn't get much better than that, my friend. So whose fault is it? Why aren't you capable of beating him? He was silent, but I could practically see his gaze turn red. A singular, overwhelming emotion flared up within him. And then he stood up, taking jerky but powerful steps toward me. I stood up as well, taking a few steps forward before we were chest to chest. Or something like that. He was just so much taller. And then, his hand shot out. I felt it coming well in advance, but I just stood there anyway, letting his hand go around my collar. It didn't clamp down, but my powerlessness was obvious. I could kill you in a squeeze, friend. At least now you're confident in something. But is it worth being so confident in something so damn easy? Does it matter to you? Who would be too dead to care? Yeah, you're a fucking liar. No, I just want my friend to be fucking better. I suddenly have a feeling that you haven't been trying nearly as hard as I thought you have. Maybe you've just been pretending. Honestly, I don't care. So long as you man the fuck up and start giving a damn. Because when I see fuckers like you pissing away all your talent with a shit attitude, I get a little pissed off myself. So go ahead and just try to fucking kill me. You don't have the fucking balls. He was silent as I smiled in his face. Then again, my teeth were gritted. He started clamping down on my collar pretty hard. I heard it first, then felt it. The coat gave. My collarbone crumpled inward. His brow went up, and his hand loosened as the snap sounded, letting me go and stepping backward. His aura flared with confusion, then anxiety, as he backed away. I suddenly felt what had made him let go. A sharp lance of wind had sliced his hand open. Fiden appeared beside me, still limping, and Amara caught me from behind, her staff held at the ready. I took a knee, my arm hanging limply beside me and in excruciating pain. Thankfully, my pain tolerance was well adapted due to recent events. That's when the door flew open, and the puppet master walked in and shot a look at Vetsmon. You, get the hell out. I'll find you later for a talk. Vetsmon didn't even get a chance to respond before he was summarily thrown through the doorway with a gust of wind. Then, Vizen, the puppet master's standby medic, walked in. Heal his bone. Hopefully this won't affect you for the upcoming battles. I've dealt with worse. Come sit. Vizen brought me over to a chair, which I sat in while he held my arm. A large spell was cast that started to affect the bone. This may hurt. Try me. I grimaced as the bone crackled back into place. I slammed my fist against the wall, but generally bore with it as everything returned to its place. Once everything stopped moving, I let out a breath of relief. The spell would continue for a few more minutes, but the worst of it was over. I turned to Amara and smiled. Thanks for saving me, dear. M.M. I just didn't expect that he'd actually hurt you. Guess he forgot just how weak I was. Well, a knight who harms his own squad has no right to be on it. The puppet master suddenly spoke. I was standing outside wondering what was going on with all the shouting. It seemed like you guys were arguing. Like she said though, I didn't think he'd actually hurt you. Seems he can't control his temper, like some sort of massive child. So it seems like he needs to be punished like a child. Well, if I may. You may not. The very man who's supposed to protect you has harmed you. To not even speak of punishment, he doesn't deserve to be on your squad after that. He spoke with an unarguable conviction. I just sighed. Second chances, puppet master. We want him to learn from this, which he can't do if he's kicked. We still have another trip left. I'll need my shield. Also, don't tell his father. Are you kidding me? I was going to make the call as soon as I left. Behavior like this is an embarrassment to his family. If you want him to learn, then we should allow his family to reteach him just what it means to be a Verganite. Agreed. Amara chimed, my head turning toward her. I could tell how pissed she was, so her next words weren't surprising. You're the one person we need to protect and he just threatened to kill you before almost snapping your neck like a twig. I didn't think he could throw a tantrum like that, and it was clear that it was an accident. But his actions and words are a stain on the honor of the Verga family, like the puppet master said. He doesn't deserve anything less than the punishment he would receive from his family. But even if I agree with you, there's still the issue of the next excursion. Who's going to be our shield? Amara went silent. It was the end of the year, and we only had one more trip left. But if it followed the trend set by previous trips, this would be the most dangerous one. We couldn't just pull a knight from somewhere else. All the other squads were already set in stone. Anybody else who was free was probably at the bottom of the elite rankings. They would be more of a hindrance than a help. If Fetzmon left, we'd be screwed for the next trip. I just prefer not to go at that point. I shrugged. Listen, we can save it for later. 
For now, we need the guy. Let him serve his purpose for the last month and then grill him all you like. You're being awfully lenient to a man who just threatened your life. The puppet master looked at me with scrutinizing eyes, making me smile. What can I say? I'm just such a generous and kind person. I don't know about that, but you at least have a point. I couldn't send you out without him, and you need to go on the last trip. I suppose he needs to stay, but I can guarantee that as soon as the trip is done, you won't see him again for a very long time. His parents will still be notified. So long as I get my shield. I shrugged. The puppet master and Amara had good points, but I wouldn't put my life at risk just because they wanted to teach him a lesson. At that moment, Bizen's spell finished. I shifted my arm around a bit, feeling piercing pains. But otherwise, it was operational. Your arm will take some time to heal the small stuff and properly seal the bone. Otherwise, it'll work as intended so long as you don't put it under heavy strain. I'll do my best. To take care of it, I hope. Well, I'll just heal you again if necessary. He smiled before going over to Fiden and Tana, checking their conditions and ushering Fiden back to bed. Once all that was done, the two instructors prepared to leave, and the puppet master turned around at the door for a last word. I'll take care of Vetmon. I can already tell you he won't be winning tomorrow. We'll see if I allow him to even compete. Regardless, you need to focus on yourself, John. After tomorrow, you'll be battling the best warlocks and knights the Magisterium has to offer. Heal up and prepare. Already on it. I spoke while taking out a cigar, lighting it and letting out some puffs of smoke. After that, given it was already evening, Amara and I left, Fiden and Tana were released from the medical ward, and everyone went back to their residences. We went back to the hotel where we ordered dinner. We ate in a strange silence before retiring for the final hours of the night. Amara finally broke the silence as we finished washing up. You know, you didn't have to push so far. I know you were trying to get him motivated, but it devolved to a point it didn't need to. Actually, I'm thinking I did a pretty good job. I managed to get Vetsmon of all people riled up. Didn't think it was possible. But was that necessary? Or did you do it just to do it? Because now your friend may not like you anymore. Losing a friend like that doesn't seem like the right thing to do just because he didn't want to be as optimistic as you. It wasn't about being optimistic. I let out a breath of smoke, lounging back onto my couch. It's a mindset issue. I made my point when talking to him, and it still stands. He's scared of losing. And more importantly, he's scared of shooting for an unlikely goal. And because he's scared, he doesn't try. Now I know that he probably hasn't been giving his full effort at all this year. The guy is so talented that everything just comes to him, which makes him complacent, as most talented people become at some point. I get that. But why did you have to do it like that? It would have been better to do it literally any other way. At least a way that doesn't try to end your friendship and leave you hurt. I don't know. It just happened that way, and I rolled with it. I don't particularly care though. If he hadn't hurt me it wouldn't have been such a big deal. And it was an accident anyway, so I don't really care. I mean, the healing magic is so good. What's one broken bone? I shrugged. With this world's healing, there was little I had to worry about so long as it didn't instantly kill me. So who cared about a little broken collarbone? In mere minutes it was already put back together. Amara sighed. I still think it could have been handled better. Besides, I don't think it was that big of an issue. It was though. How? He was doing just fine and getting stronger every day. We all are. And that would have continued without you fracturing our squad like this. So what was the point? The point is complacency. I looked her dead in the eye. If he gets complacent, then he's probably going to die. Omara, I've gotten much stronger since I've started down this road, and yet every time I go out to battle like we have been, I feel like I might die. Take our battle with the Royal. If I hadn't pulled out that machine gun, we might have been fucked. And the only reason I was able to do so was because I had trained my ass off for weeks. Every single day it felt like my head was going to explode out of anxiety and paranoia. So I kept training, and I was just barely able to get that weapon during the battle. So if I hadn't trained that hard, what would that have meant for us? She went silent. The answer was pretty clear. We may have died if I was any slower. That was too close for comfort, and something I didn't want to ever happen again. I sighed. I just don't want any of us to die now or in the future, but I can only help myself. And here I am, feeling all of this urgency, while the talented Vetsmon just sits back on his ass and waits for his strength to come to him. One part of me gets pissed seeing that, while the other part gets scared because if he keeps that up, somewhere down the line he's going to pay the price for it. I don't want that for my friend. So yeah, I'm going to press the issue. Maybe it'll be the wake-up call he needs. Amara didn't respond, 
lingering for a moment before walking over and sitting beside me. Is this that tough love you spoke of before? MHM. HM. So, how do I know if I'm getting complacent? I come from the same talent and background. Maybe I'm not giving my full effort either. Just know that where you're at isn't enough. You should be shooting for higher goals, things much greater than the magisterium. Do that, and I think you'll be fine. And if I see you getting lazy, you know I'll call you out on it. MM, good. And I'll try to help you as much as I can. I know you've got more than enough pushing you. I'll try to ease the burden. I appreciate it, my sweet. I gave her a peck on the nose before we both headed to bed for the night.